Hello guys, this is June Area. I'm an artist producer and filmmaker based in Seoul, South Korea. I mainly film Korean pop music videos and fashion. I have started filming some of my projects with the new Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. On the previous video I talked about the camera form factor. This time I will show you the camera menu and while we're going through each of the options I will give you my insights and best practices on each function. So let's check out a bit the operation system of the camera. This operation system is the same as what is in the Usha Mini Pro, which is really intuitive and easy to use. As I've been using Blackmagic Cinema cameras for a while, it was really easy to me to find the options I was looking for and felt right at home. It's actually a really amazing experience to have this kind of operating system in such a small form and with a touch screen. I think it's like nothing that's out there right now. Uh, first of all, uh, you can get rid of the interface uh, simply by scrolling up or down and you can bring it back in the same way, uh, which is uh, nice for some occasions that you don't uh, want to be distracted by all this information on your screen. At the bottom of the screen, uh, you can see a live uh, histogram. With this, you can adjust the exposure of the image in order to make sure uh, you're not filming uh, too dark or you're not losing too much detail uh, in the highlights and so on. It feels really natural to look at this histogram and adjust the aperture of the lenses using the wheel at your uh, index finger on the grip of the camera or uh, the aperture of the lenses if you have uh, some kind of cine lenses. I will also be talking about setting exposure and how the ISO works in this camera in detail in a future episode. Episode. Next to the histogram uh, we can see the record button which you can uh, just click and uh, it will start recording and then click again to stop recording. Do mind that although there is no delay when you start recording there is some kind of delay when you stop recording depending on the media. I got this happening with this SD card for example but it doesn't happen with the SSD. In other case when it does happen it happens both with using the interface here or even when using the physical recording buttons. So you might be a little careful because you might think okay I didn't press it properly uh, that's why it's not stopping and then you will press it again and actually initiate a new recording. This is more obvious when you're using the touch screen because there is no physical response from the interface like there is when you're pressing the physical button. This record button will turn into a blinking exclamation mark when you're trying to record something that requires higher bandwidth than your current media allows and you're dropping frames. Next to the recording button there is an indicator for the card slots. Slot number one is uh, the CFAS card slot. Slot number two is the SD card slot. When you connect an SSD though, uh, it takes the place of the SD card at slot number 2. When you take it off, uh, the system goes back to the SD card. When you insert a media, it will tell you how much remaining time there is depending on your current recording settings. For example, in this 120GB Sun Extreme Pro SD card, I can record 4K DNG RAW 4.1 at 24 frames per second for 21 minutes. Or I can switch to something like ProRes Proxy HD and get 440 minutes. In fact, I can record 28 hours of footage at this quality when I connect this external SSD on. When you click on any of these slot indicators, it brings you this little menu. This is the place where you can check out whether your media is empty or it already has some data in and you can actually format the card in camera either in uh, OSX Extended uh, for Apple computers or XFAT for both Windows and Apple computers. When you're formatting you can actually choose the real number and that affects uh, the file names in case you have a very complex project with many cameras and a lot of media to manage around. It takes about 10 seconds to format this card and I could format uh, my SSD as well in about the same time. Next there is the audio indicators where you can see the audio levels that the microphones receive currently. Uh, you can see them moving as I'm talking actually. Clicking on it will bring this little menu where you can adjust the gain for each of the microphone channels as well as the speakers. We will see later that you're able to connect any audio input or microphone of this camera to an audio channel. All these settings here are also available later on in the main menu of the camera. Starting from the top right corner you can actually see the battery indicator. When you click it, it just changes from showing you the graphical representation of the remaining battery level or the actual percentage or voltage. Then we have the color controls. Uh, you can adjust both white balance and tint. When you click on this, you have five different presets for the user light sources, where you can adjust by a bit if you like, or you can choose custom white balance and set it to whatever you like. Finally, there is a really nice option where you can set your white balance automatically by clicking the auto white balance button here and then pointing the camera and matching the square to anything pure white around or a white uh, color balance chart, of course. 
When you are shooting in RAW, of course, white balance and tint are just metadata and you can change them as you like. The only way these parameters here affect the final RAW file is at what the initial state the file will be when you open it up for editing. From there, you can set it as you like and will have the same response as it would have as if you were doing this in camera. On the other hand, for ProRes, the white balance is baked in, so you cannot change it in post-production like you do with a RAW file, but you can of course adjust it in other ways very easily and except uh, you really have extreme differences in the actual white balance and what you have set, it's not such a big issue. Of course, you might want to deliver those video files to somebody else and you want your files to look neat out of the box. It also affects what you're seeing on the screen when you're shooting, so if you have a big difference in white balance, it might look quite unpleasant to look at while you're shooting. So it's a good practice to roughly set the white balance and tint, no matter if you're filming in RAW or ProRes. Next to that, there is the ISO. This camera has a dual native ISO. In order to understand in depth what this means, you have to understand how cinema camera sensors work to begin with. In fact, given a camera with a single native ISO, no matter how you change the ISO, nothing happens at the sensor level. The sensor does not become more or less sensitive or receives less or more light. It receives the exact same amount of light and the data is identical. It's what happens to this data after that and in the case of RAW, nothing happens on the data actually. If the sensor does not receive enough light to begin with, erasing the ISO will just lift the gain of the image the exact same way you can actually do in post. This is a bit different in many stills cameras where there is analog gain applied between the different ISOs, but in similar cameras and particularly in this one, this is not the case. All that of course is when talking about RAW, because if you're filming ProRes, the adjustments made when changing the ISO are permanently saved in the data of course. So the camera having two native ISOs, it means that some ISO values are handled by the lower native ISO and some are handled by the high ISO. It's like you have two different sensors in the camera, one that performs better in daytime and well-lit scenarios and one that performs better in low light. The two native values for this camera are 400 and 3200 with the high ISO having slightly less dynamic range. The changeover happens at ISO 1250, which is where the high ISO kicks in. There is also something very interesting happening from ISO 8000 up to ISO 25600, which is the highest ISO that this camera can do, uh, at least in camera, as it appears there is some kind of analog gain applied that cannot be replicated in post. It's almost like you have three native ISOs actually. As I said, we'll be talking a lot about this and how exactly it works and best practices for ISO and exposure with this camera in a future episode. Next to the ISO indicator, you can see the recording time of the current or the last clip. When you hit the record button, this becomes red. If you click it, you actually get the time code, which is really useful for synchronizing several cameras together. Next to that, there is the iris indication, which shows the current aperture of your lenses and lets you adjust it by clicking on it, if of course you are using electronic lenses, which I'm not right now. Next to that, there is the shutter control. You can change this to be either in shutter angle, which is traditionally for cinema cameras, or shutter speed like on stills cameras. In both cases, it does exactly the same thing. Personally, I think the shutter angle is much easier and better to work with, and I think the only reason they have the option to change to shutter speed is so people that are coming from stills cameras feel more comfortable. The shutter in general is the adjustment for the amount of time the sensor will be receiving light for in every frame you film. The more the time the sensor receives light, the brighter the image, but also the motion becomes more blurry. In order to film cameras, that was actually a physical thing. Here is emulated in different ways. I will also be talking more about the shutter in a future video that I will be talking about exposure. What I want to mention though is this interesting option called auto exposure. What it does is that it uses the camera's metering and automatically sets the shutter to compensate for exposure. Now, that sounds like a great idea, right? Changing the shutter has some significant effect on the look of the image with more blurry or staccato looking motion. I don't think it should ever be used on any kind of produced material, but it might come really handy for running against shooters that film things like weddings or documentaries 
uh, with events that just happen once before they are gone forever and are more interested in getting the shot at the right exposure and are happy to sacrifice a bit uh, the motion feeling of the footage. In addition to shutter only, you can actually choose to use the iris as well. So what would this do is to first try to compensate the exposure by using the shutter and if that's not enough then it will change the iris of the lenses as well. Then there is also the option of giving priority to the iris and then to the shutter. The iris also affects the look in a very drastic way as the whole deep of field changes but again for some situations or for casual shooters like video loggers this is a really nice option as they can go in and out of buildings and dark places and come out in the sun again without having to worry about setting exposure all the time. I would like to see the ISO as well being included in these auto exposure options. Then there is the frame rate indicator. By clicking it you can choose the frame rate. Things get a bit interesting here. If you're coming from something like the Ursa Mini Pro or a RED or ARRI camera, you will already know about the difference between project frame rate and off-speed frame rate. The project frame rate is the frame rate of your final deliverable. If you're shooting a feature film or a music video for example, this is usually 24 frames per second. If you're shooting something like a live event, this would usually be 30 frames per second. You can choose up to 60 frames as a project frame rate that gives this super smooth motion feeling that's not desirable for more cinematic looking projects but might be something useful for things like sports or nature. When you import these videos for editing, the software will recognize the video as whatever project frame rate you set here. The values for the project frame rate are pretty standard to cover all formats and standards between different countries with options such as 24, 25, 30, 50, 60 and all the usual little offsets of those. This is not how you're supposed to be doing slow motion in this camera though. For that there is the off speed frame rate option where when enabled you can choose how many frames you will be filming per second regardless of your project frame rate. So what happens for example is that you can have your project frame rate set at 30 frames per second. Then you can have your off speed frame rate at 60 frames per second. This means that for every second of real time passing the camera will be saving 2 seconds of 30 frames per second footage. So I actually started recording at this scenario and you can see how the time goes 2 times faster. When you import that in your editing software, it will recognize as 30 frames per second video and when played back it will have half the speed. You can see why this is a really elegant way to do things. In stills cameras for example, when you want to do slow motion, uh, you have to change to 60 frames per second and that will write a video file that is 60 frames per second. When you import it in your editing software, you have to specifically tell it to conform it at whatever frame rate your project is at and that's how you get slow motion. It can get complicated with projects where you're switching between normal speed and slow motion. With this camera though, you don't need to do all that and that's exactly where the high frame rate button comes in. When pressed the camera automatically switches to whatever slow motion you would like to have without changing the project frame rate. So when you import the files in your editing software they will all be at the same frame rate just the ones you film in slow motion will be in slow motion. You can actually set the off speed to anything between 5 frames per second up to 60 frames per second when in 4K and anything between 5 frames per second up to 120 frames per second when you're using what is called a windowed mode which is using a smaller part of the sensor in order to achieve the higher refresh mode that is required for higher frame rates. This is totally normal for any camera system in the world and that's how higher frame rates are achieved. An easy way to visualize how this works is thinking there is a guy painting the pixels of the camera and on every frame he has to run from the one side to the other trying to paint all the pixels. At the next frame the pixels reset and he has to paint them all over again. In this camera he can do that up to 60 times per second. By using a smaller part of the sensor though, the distance he has to run is smaller so he can do it more times, in this case up to 120. I would also like to mention that the shutter is also automatically updated when you're enabling the off-speed recording to match whatever feel you had when you were filming at normal speed and you don't need to specifically keep track on it. And this is where using shutter angle instead makes much more sense and it's much easier. Finally, at the top left corner you can find some additional options. The first is enabling the zebras on and off. What zebras do is to warn you that a certain part of the image is too bright to fit into the current dynamic range and it will be clipped. You can even set your zebras below 100 uh, so you can get such a warning at different levels and use zebras for making sure a face is not overexposed for example. 
Good images do not necessarily come out by making sure nothing is clipped, but rather from making sure the most important parts of the image are well exposed, even if you lose some information on the highlights or the shadows. So having some zebras on your image could be totally normal in many cases. In the next option, you can turn on and off the focus picking and adjust how bold it will be. Good focus picking is something you would expect from a cinema camera and Blackmagic cameras probably have one of the best focus picking in the industry that makes keeping focus uh, really easy and nice without any doubts. It's really easy to set perfect focus using it. There are also situations that you might be carrying this camera on a gimbal in an external shot under the very hot sun and you're so tired and sweating trying to follow the talent and having this focus picking right there seeing what is in focus can give a quick indication that you're out of focus so maybe you should take a step back or closer. The next option is the aspect guides. Turning this on can be really helpful when you're shooting in different aspect ratios like the anamorphic modes with the black bars or 4x3. This does not result into footage with black bars on top or the sides. This is only a tool to help you frame your shot nicely for the delivery format. Next, you can enable some things like the thirds if you need assistance with your framing or you want a cross or dot in the center which is really useful if you're trying to film for example a chart or you're trying to frame frame your shot uh, very precisely during tests with different lenses and so on. Then you have this uh, safe area guide that it might become useful in many ways like in the broadcast making sure nothing is out of the frame or like uh, you're planning to stabilize this footage later in post so maybe you want to make sure you have uh, some extra space to crop or without losing any on your framing. Finally you can enable a disabled false color which is something you would not expect from a camera at this price point. False color is used to be able to adjust the exposure not in the overall image but in very specific areas of the image. Uh, uh, with green meaning good uh, mid exposure, uh, reds meaning very high exposure and blues meaning under exposure. This is particularly useful when you're trying to do your lighting ratios. You might want a specific exposure on the talent's face for example and then your background should be a few times darker. This tool helps you measure and find any inconsistencies. In fact, you can take a screenshot from your favorite movie and apply false color there and see what kind of ratios they did uh, to achieve that look and then use that false color in this camera to try to create a similar lighting ratio. Really nice. Finally, you can see this little loot indication here, which means what you're currently seeing is not the original image, but rather the one that has some color and contrast settings applied. This is normally for monitoring purposes only and your videos are saved in log, so you can have the maximum information in post-production, but when you record in progress, you can actually choose to record the image with that loot applied on, which is really fantastic for uh, jobs with a very quick turnover time or if you're filming casually like your vacation and you just don't want to do any post-production and you like something that comes out pretty out of the camera. In this case, the loot indication disappears from the top right corner and appears in red color next to the record button. Remember that any of these options can be actually attached to the function buttons above. So for example, I have the force color right here on the first button and turning the loot on and off in the second button, uh, then the focus picking on the third one. As we will see, all these are fully customizable. By dragging your finger towards the center, you get a different screen. Here you can actually set some really nice metadata for your current shot as well for uh, the whole project. You can set the project name, the director and operator name as well as the camera number via this nice keyboard uh, that comes up. Then on the clips tab you can set the reel, scene and take. You can actually mark the last take as a good take and put some information in like if it was shot in an interior and exterior environment and if it was uh, day or night. Last there is this lens data. This will of course be filled automatically if you have electronic lenses but in the case of manual lenses you will have to fill them on your own along with any filter you have used. All this might seem way too detailed and a complete overkill for the casual shooter but it's something really great and almost mandatory for higher budget and more organized shots. It's pretty much a digital slate and it's not uh, just useful for the sake of organization. It also helps a lot uh, the person that offloads and manages the data and ultimately it also helps the editor as well. Pressing the playback button allows you to preview whatever we have filmed already. 
the interface is really simple and you can skip to whatever part of the clip you like and you can enable looping on and off. An interesting point here is that you will only be able to see the clips that you recorded at the current project frame rate and coding you are filming at. This means that if you currently have any flavor of RAW selected and you have ProRes clips filmed as well in the same media, you will not be able to preview them here unless you change to ProRes coding. With any flavor of RAW selected you can watch any RAW clip. With any ProRes flavor selected you can also watch all of the ProRes clips. At the same time only the clips of your project frame rate will appear here. So let's say you have filmed some clips at 30 frames per second but now you are filming at 24 frames per second. When you hit the play button only the clips that were at 24 frames per second will appear. Of course this is the project frame rate, so when you're filming slow motion the clips will appear here normally even if they were filmed at 60 frames per second and they will actually playback in slow motion which is really great. The reason for hiding the rest of the clips in playback is because usually in professional environments you would never change uh, between RAW and ProRes and project frame rates like that. So the camera assumes that you prefer to see the files of the format that you're currently shooting and hides any other irrelevant shots that that might be in the media. Now this is something that you have to remember as it could be quite a shock when your shots are suddenly not there. Well they are there just you have to choose the same codec and project frame rate for them to appear. Also while on the topic do mind there is no way to delete files in camera and that's done by design. Uh, you cannot do such a thing in any serious professional cinema camera and there are two good reasons for that one is technical and the other is practical. The technical reason is that as you start deleting little files here and there it creates little gaps in the media that in their turn lead uh, to some large inefficiencies and complexities. Let's say you had 10 clips and you decide to delete 3 of those clips in a random position within these 10 clips. For example the 2nd, the 5th and uh, the 7th. Then when recording a new video it will go and fill those gaps. If it's longer than the first clip uh, it will have to continue to the second gap and so on. Now in order for this to work the camera needs to have a very precise file table that says ok part of this video is there and another part of the video is there. The problem is when you're writing high bitrate raw data this extra little overhead of seeking and trying to find where there is extra space to write and so on can be enough to drop several frames from the media and in general result in poor performance. There is a more important practical reason though. You might be filming a really nice perhaps a little expensive scene. At that point you might think ok this wasn't that good and we're taking another take anyways so let's delete this file so we can make some space. Then suddenly the director decides that for some circumstances it's actually impossible to film it again and says ok just uh, play back the shot once more. And then you don't have that file that might have costed thousands of dollars. If you add the chance of accidental deletion it makes pretty obvious why deleting files in a professional cinema camera is just a really terrible idea and you should just make sure you have a couple of extra media or offloading solution with you if you think you're going to need a lot of space. The camera's menu comes up by hitting the menu button. You can immediately see the refined style of the menu with organized large and easy to read options. There are 6 tabs that contain the total of the options. Each of these tabs can contain a few pages. The first tab contains the recording options. In the first page you can choose the codec, quality and resolution. There are a few combinations of these. Currently there is only Cinema DNG RAW and ProRes but in a future firmware Blackmagic RAW will also be added to this camera and will appear in this section. At the second page you have a few more options. You can choose the project frame rate and the off speed recording as explained before in the video. If you want to record more than 60 frames per second you will have to turn on the Windows Sensor options of course. If you are recording in ProRes you can actually choose to not film in log but rather directly in Rec 709 video and extended video. Here is also a very important option of whether the camera should stop recording when the media are not fast enough to support the codec quality and frame rate combination. I highly recommend you have this turned on since if you turn it off what will actually happen is that the camera will continue recording but for every frame it drops it will pretty much start a new recording resulting into multiple clips. In either case if the camera drops any frames you will get the exclamation mark indication on the record button. Finally you can choose which card you prefer to record on in case you have both cards in the camera. 
I'm assuming here that SD card means external SSD as well in case you have one connected. On the last page of the recording tab you can set up a video time lapse and you can set it to take a frame to anything between 2 frames and 10 minutes. This is a really great tool for taking documentary style time lapse videos or those fancy shots with your talent staying still and everything else moving around really fast. In theory, you can do all of those by shooting normal video and making it faster in post, but by enabling dial-ups you do not have to spend all this data to record hours of footage that you are just going to speed up later in post. There are also the options for some extra sharpening. This is only available to ProRes as with RAW you can choose the amount of sharpening you want in post. Finally, another option only available to ProRes of course is to record a loot directly on the footage. A loot is a lookup table and it's pretty much a color profile or look uh, if you rather that color grades the image so it's not this flat log that comes straight out of the raw data. Usually it has some contrast, saturation and color adjustments and you can make it on your own or download it from some website. In fact, you can film something, color correct it and grade it in Resolve and then save that look, import it in the camera and use that in the future. The next tab contains the monitoring options. You can set completely separate options for the camera's internal screen and for what's going out through the HDMI. And there are also a few options that apply to both. A clean feed means that none of the options apply and you just see what you're filming in full screen without any information. The only thing that you can keep enabled in this mode is the application of a loot on your image. You can turn on and off the zebras, the focus assist, any frame guides and grids, the safe area guide as well as the false color. Each of these can be enabled and disabled directly from the main screen and we already talked about them and what each of them do previously in the video. On the next page you have the option to turn the status text on and off which pretty much removes all that information from the screen, something that you can simply do by scrolling up and down. This is different from the clean feed since it still keeps on things like zebras, focus picking and so on. There is an option to remove the histogram and audio levels indicator in exchange for codec and resolution information. I guess this would be alright if you have an external monitor with its own meters connected on and you don't need things like the histogram on the camera screen. Finally you can adjust the screen brightness. Uh, I usually have this at 100% when filming outside. Uh, here I have it down to 6% since I'm uh, filming with another camera and want it to match uh, the background exposure. When I was outside and I had the screen at 100%, I didn't have any problems really with it unless it was in a really weird angle on the roniness and I could barely see the monitor. It's uh, still just a camera's monitor we're talking about and if you're filming outside under the very bright sun all the time, you might consider a sun hood or an external monitor dedicated for shooting in very bright environments. When it comes to the HDMI output, you can turn on and off uh, the same options as the internal monitor, but in the second page you have the option to display different information. I have connected my video assist on the Pocket's uh, HDMI port with the status text enabled. When you have the cinematographer option on, you pretty much see the same information you see on the camera's main screen. But if you change to director, you can see some different information like the real number, the scene, the take, the camera and operator name, as well as the time code and loot applied on the image. And you see how that real information I have shown a bit earlier can become really handy in more organized shots. All these are of course information that are important to the director who shouldn't care about the histogram or the shutter speed or how much time you have remaining on your cards for example. Finally, there are some monitoring options applicable to both the internal screen and the external one. There are the type of frame guides, guide opacity where the zebras start to appear and quite a few options for the focus picking. You can select the focus color between green, blue, white, black and red. You can select how bold the focus assistance is and you can actually select whether you want lines or just a peak. The peak just makes the in-focus area bolder and sharper without coloring it which is a much less intrusive way to peak focus. Do mind that all of these settings also apply to when you are playing your footage back so if you don't want them during previewing your footage you will have to disable them or just enable the clean feed temporarily. Finally you can set the rest of the guides like the grids and uh, safe area guides. As I said before you can also set all this stuff from the main screen without going into the menus at all and as you will see you can actually assign any of these uh, to the function buttons. The next tab is about the audio in the camera. 
You have two mono audio channels and you have a wide range of options to assign what will be recorded on each of those channels. So you can choose the left or the right of the internal microphones or you can choose the camera mono which is a mix down of those two. Then you can choose the input from the XLR. If it's something like a microphone, you should choose the mic option and that includes microphones that are phantom powered and incredible option for a camera at this price point. There's also the XLR line option, which is when you connect things like a guitar, for example, or uh, music through the XLR port that wouldn't need to use the preamp. Like the XLR, there is a line option as well as mic option for the 3.5 mm jack port. You can get either the left or the right channel or a mix down for each of those. Then you can choose what you will have on the second channel. Again, these are just uh, two mono channels. We result into one stereo channel, so you will not be able to really record something like uh, a whole band in separate channels in camera. But these are already extremely decent options for a camera in this form. Below, you can see, of course, each of the channels levels, and you can actually see it moving following my voice now as I speak. You can also set the gain for either of the channels, and just to enter the fun size how well designed the interface is, uh, there is a little magnet uh, that sorts uh, at 50% gain, so it's easy to reset the gain on that level. On the second page, you can set the headphone volume, which is what comes out from the 3.5mm output port at the left of the camera. And there is also the speaker volume, which refers to the volume of the camera's internal speaker. Finally, you have a couple of options for when you're using a microphone through the XLR port, and these become available when you select XLR as your input. The next tab is the setup. It's the place that every other option that doesn't really fit into recording, monitoring or audio is located at. So here you can set the date and time, which is quite important to be accurate since your files will be named using this date. You can choose the language, which is just English for now. Then you can choose how the shutter will be represented as an angle or speed. Then there is this flicker free shutter based on option and you can choose between 50 and 60 Hz and I'm guessing that's how the camera can automatically choose uh, what's the best shutter depending on the country you are as the available shutter options are actually affected by this. You can also enable or disable lens stabilization here providing you have electronic lenses that support it. Then there is this time code drop frame option which is for a very specific scenario for 2997 and 5994 frames per second projects. In the next tab you can set up each of your function keys. There are several options to choose from. For example you can program it to set some parameter to a specific value. That could be the frame rate, uh, lens iris, the white balance, the ISO or the shutter speed. But you also have it as a toggle function where you can enable and disable uh, things like false color, uh, focus assist, frame guides, display loot, uh, clean feed, uh, image stabilization, off speed recording, a safe area guide, uh, grid uh, and zebras. Quite a few options there. For the options that have to do with monitoring, you can also choose whether this parameter is going to affect the camera's internal screen or the HDMI output. In the next page, you can see the options for uh, enabling and disabling the tally light, and you can set uh, some brightness levels for it. Uh, there is a factory reset uh, where it resets uh, all uh, the camera settings in uh, the initial uh, position. There's also this black shading option here for calibrating the sensor. This is something you would do on the Ursa Mini Pro camera. I don't know why is there as a Pocket 4K is not uh, supposed to have it. Uh, maybe it will have it in the future. Uh, you can see here I'm running uh, actually software version uh, 0.0 .0 because this is one of the very, very early cameras, but it's actually running uh, 4.2 right now. Uh, you can see here this playback thing which uh, chooses when you hit the play button or when you're previewing files whether it's going to continue play forever or it's just going to play one clip at a time. When I am in full production environments with a director and everything, I want this set up for a single clip because uh, the director is going to ask for just playback something and I don't want it to keep going on to the next or the previous clips. When I'm casually shooting though and I'm in the subway and I just want to preview whatever I shot that day, uh, choosing all clips is really nice. Finally, we have these Bluetooth options. I'm not aware of any applications that I can use uh, to control the camera yet, so we have to wait for that. I'm guessing through this application you will be able to control uh, most functions of the camera and electronic lenses and change the frame rates and uh, even pull focus. 
In the next tab you can uh, make presets which is really nice. Those presets contain the total set of the options and can be actually exported and imported between different cameras via your media. So you might be working on a couple of complex projects at the same time or you might have some specific type of shot like a music video and then another like a wedding and, and so on. Each of them uh, you work with different people and you connect uh, different things on the camera like microphones and external monitors and you don't want to go through all the settings every time and change them and reset them. So you just save a nice preset containing those settings. The great thing is that you can export it and then import it on the second unit as well so it has the exact same settings. Finally you can load up to six lookup tables that you can apply either just for monitoring or for permanently burning them in ProRes footage. This can also be imported and exported via your media. So thank you guys for watching this video. I tried my best to show you how to operate this camera and hopefully give you some understanding about how to best use it. I'll be doing more videos that I'll be talking more about other matters like the camera formats and media, the ISO, the exposure controls, uh, as well as things like color grading and so on. I also have a Roniness, I have the Metabone Speed Booster and many other things I want to talk about and how to use it on this camera. So have a nice day and best luck on your future shots.